Welcome everyone. Recording in progress. Welcome everyone to this uh, panel discussion uh, within the setting of the conference about wealth and inequality in competition law. And it's been a very rich conference so far. Um, it's an interesting question, of course, uh, considering inequality and wealth within competition law. Um, and I'm very happy to chair this panel. My name is Anna Gebrandi. I'm a professor of competition law at Utrecht University. And from my perspective, my academic perspective, if we zoom out a little bit, the question of inequality and equity and wealth concerns within competition law seems to be part of a greater discussion within competition law about concerns that are not always considered at the heart of competition law. So there's a sustainability discussion going on. There's the big tech and democracy, the big tech and society discussion going on as well. Now, as to wealth and inequality, I think most seem to agree that good competition laws and good enforcement of those laws already has redistributive effects in general, low prices, consumer choice, stuff like that. We all know about that from a competition law perspective. And in this session, we will therefore not zoom out, but zoom in. We will zoom in and have a conversation on how competition agencies across the world might factor in, can factor in, already do factor in inequality and equity concerns in their daily competition law work. So I'm very pleased to introduce our panel members. We have Martijn Snoep from the Dutch Authority from, for Consumers and Markets, the chairman of the Dutch Authority for Consumers and Markets. Yeah, you waved. Welcome, Martijn. We have Johannes Lianas, who is the president of the Hellenic Competition Commission. Welcome, Johannes. Also wave so that everybody sees you. And then we have a small change in the panel. We have Joaquin Lopez Valles, head of the, and I'm reading now because this is a difficult, difficult one, head of the advocacy department of the Spanish Commission of Markets and Competition. Also welcome to you, Joaquin. But we also, we're not just the European Union centered in this panel. We are very happy that we're joined by Teresa Moreira, who is the head of competition and consumer policies branch of UNCTAD to share with us a more international perspective. Also wave Teresa so that everybody sees you. So in just one minute, we'll start the, I'll kick off the discussion, but we have some general points here on the chat. Um, if you have questions, drop them in the chat, but because I'm chairing a conversation and not so much a, a series of presentations, I cannot moderate the chat and moderate the discussion at the same time. So I'm asking Kati and Jan to help me with the questions in the chat. We will not wait to the very, very end before we start discussing questions that pop up in the chat. Um, so you, you can just pop them in whenever you think, and then at some point we'll stop the discussion and we'll turn to questions. Um, a further point of order is that Johannes has to leave at some point, probably earlier than the end of this session. And we are going to finish uh, sharp at 2.30 because also Martijn has to leave at that time. And also it's good practice to finish on time. So with that said, Let's start this conversation and I'm going to ask Teresa first, Teresa, because your, 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 let's say your perspective might be slightly different from what this audience, which is mostly competition lawyers and competition economics, is used to. So let me ask you a, a general question. So in the first round, we're going to have short answers so that also all the speakers can sort of introduce themselves and you can get used to their mode of, of conversation. Teresa, can you tell us a little bit about the role that UNCTAD plays and how competition law is also part of that? Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. So I can start by saying that UNCTAD, which is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, is uh, here because we are the focal point for competition law and policy within the United Nations system, uh, mostly because we are the guardians of the United Nations set of principles and rules on competition, which was adopted in 1980 and that basically gathers a number of recommendations, mostly addressed to developing countries because developing countries are our focus so that they can um, introduce competition law and policy uh, within a policy mix to pursue uh, economic growth and inclusive and sustainable development strategies. What is interesting about the UN set it, is that it recognizes, especially for developing countries, that they should be allowed to 
adopt and implement competition law and policy according to their specific circumstances, that is to say, with more leeway than in Europe, for instance, we would have looked into competition law and policy. Um, but in any case, the achievements, not only of the sets, because as I said, last year we celebrated 40 years, but, but so many other international organizations and networks have been assisting developing countries across the world. What is interesting is that by now we have something like 140, uh, uh, 140 countries having adopted competition law and policy and having set uh, institutions to enforce it. So I think there is huge consensus of the relevance and the importance of competition law and policy, even though in the developing world, let me put this in very broad terms, because for instance, the BRICS are a completely different uh, group and least developed countries also, um, there is this recognition that they should use it according to their needs, priorities, and I believe that um, contributing to fight inequality can play a big role. Thanks. Yeah, that's, so it, that's already an interesting perspective because it seems that uh, they're, they're from, from the perspective of, of developing countries, it might actually be a more integrated vision on competition law and inequality concerns than me, but I'm just going to talk, speak for myself as a European Union competition lawyer are generally used to. So let's turn to our European uh, colleagues. Teresa is also from Europe, but you know what I mean. Johannes, if I ask you to reflect a little bit on this, then, then where are we now in, in this discussion on the broader concerns in competition law? Can you, can you help us out a bit and sketch the perspectives that we have? So I'm specifically, you have to unmute yourself first though. So yes, um, so it's a quite complex uh, issue. And of course, um, you know, we have been discussing about this the last few years uh, more intensively, although um, there has been some debate um, on distributed justice and competition and policy uh, for, for some decades now. Um, I would say um, uh, one aspect that I think um, is important to have in mind is that um, why, you know, are we arguing about inequality or unfairness in the context of competition, but more generally? So one may argue against inequality and unfairness because of concerns that an unequal distribution of resources or of opportunities, uh, let's say, will lessen uh, economic welfare for the less well-off. So uh, that would be one possible uh, dimension. Alternatively, uh, one might object to unfairness uh, because of the intrinsic value of equal distribution uh, in a just society. And I would say here, you know, there are um, these two versions of, um, you know, distributive justice uh, equality argument. The first one, uh, which um, has been uh, somehow addressed as the prioritarians. Uh, so these prioritarians, they give priority to the less well off instead of caring about equal distribution itself. So basically there is an instrumental perspective uh, on uh, equality. Um, and their aim is to reduce uh, the inequalities from which the better off suffer, but not to level down those that are better off, so as to reduce inequality between them and those that are uh, worse off. And the second ones, uh, the egalitarians, basically, uh, egalitarianism, this places an intrinsic value on equality distribution. So in itself, basically, it's bad. Uh, it's not an instrumental goal, because, I mean, I mean we care about the uh, welfare uh, of, uh, of a specific group, um, but basically because it's unfair for some to be uh, worse off um, uh, than others. Uh, and there you may have, uh, to a certain extent, uh, different um, perspective because the difference, uh, and these, these are, I would say, these two approaches are different from the utilitarian approach that um, one may have, and um, uh, which could be somehow based on economic efficiency, for instance. So the difference, let's say, for an utilitarian, a prioritarian uh, will accept that the well-being aggregate can be reduced, so as to transfer resources to those uh, whose well-being is very low, because basically here it's to max the objective is to maximize uh, the moral value of the distribution uh, of resources. Um, so I would say, uh, and the third possible approach here uh, about um, you know inequality. Uh, is um, to uh, somehow not necessarily to take into account uh, welfare, 
uh, but basically uh, to address the issue of the self-respect or the moral status, mm -hmm. let's say, of, um, of, uh, of citizens in, in a specific uh, policy. So here uh, we, we, sh we will have to be concerned uh, not about outcomes, it's a equal distribution of certain outcomes, um, but basically of the structural positioning of the uh, virus individual agents. So what we will be interested in is uh, situations of pervasive um, inequality that uh, structurally put some categories of population uh, to a, a worse situation than, uh, than others. And uh, the aim of our you know, uh, action intervention will be to uh, correct this uh, structural type of problem. Um, and in this case, you know, uh, and I bargained in, in my, in my um, paper uh, on, um, on competition as a, social, as a form of social regulation, uh, if we take this approach, uh, we shouldn't care about uh, what I would call is a simple equality issue, uh, which, you know, is the, the first and the second position, but uh, what, um, you know, has been called by uh, Michael Walser, a complex equality, yeah. because yeah. you're basically focusing on the structural positioning. Yeah. And I'm sure we later return to this uh, when we question what the Hellenic Competition Authority is doing uh, in this scene to see which one of those perspectives is the one that also is used or not. May I just say that, you know, uh, as an enforcer, uh, now I talked as an academic, as an enforcer, it's, it's a different story. Uh, because um, from theory to practice, of course, uh, there are you know, important difficulties. And also, um, uh, let me just say and that if you are an enforcer, usually it takes one or two years to be able to deal with yeah. the uh, backlog of cases that your predecessor left in order to be able to start your own uh, somehow uh, approaches. And this is, this is an important limitation, let me yeah. put it, 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 it that way. Well, we're going to turn to those approaches a bit later on. Let's first turn to uh, Joaquin. Um, so so the, the Spanish Competition Authority, can, can you tell us a little bit on, on their view on this issue or reflect a bit on what has been said so far? Yeah, good morning. Well, it's it's still the Spanish. It's still the, the Spanish morning. Uh, we, we we like to to prolong uh, uh, morning uh, uh, a little bit more than uh, other European countries. Uh, yeah. um, no, uh, I was uh, first. Uh, I was going to 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 say that uh, Cani Fernandez, the, uh, my boss and the president of the uh, CNMC, was very sad. Uh, not being able to to uh, to be here today with you uh, and she asked me to to uh, to uh, apologize on her behalf uh, but in turn i am very happy uh, to, to that gave me the opportunity to be here with you so i'm very happy uh, to be able to contribute to the to the discussion uh, so um uh, my uh, uh, I, I, to, to, to address your question, uh, Anna, I think that the, the starting point uh, for the uh, for the CNMC uh, is that uh, competition uh, policy does not have as, uh, as its primary goal, as you uh, already said in the beginning, the reduction of, of, uh, of inequality uh, and the fight or the fight uh, against uh, poverty. Uh, since competition politi policy typically has a focus on a major focus on efficiency, economic efficiency. However, economic efficiency. Uh, has a positive link with uh, the reduction of inequality in many different ways uh, beyond the most uh, simple uh, way of uh, more competition leads to better consumption condu uh, conditions in terms of lower price, uh, higher uh, quality, higher variety of goods that are relevant for those people, uh, uh, for those consumers and households uh, who have the lowest uh, income, uh, uh, food, energy, transport, and, and so on. I think there are many other uh, ways in which uh, economic efficiency and competition policy can help uh, the reduction of, uh, of inequalities. Uh, first, uh, um, competition leads to economic efficiency and that leads to more productivity, economic growth, and uh, that uh, eventually uh, leads to, uh, to better uh, working conditions and, and more jobs, more, more employment. Secondly, uh, competition uh, uh, leads to uh, more equal opportunities for everyone in the, in the societies. And, and I think there is a final point which, which is also very important, that is 
Competition policy also leads to uh, the improvement of other social policies, like, uh, for example, fighting bid rigging uh, uh, reduces the cost of the provision of public services, which are very relevant for uh, low income uh, consumers, and that can uh, uh, liberate those resources and allow the public sector to invest more or to spend more in those who are more uh, vulnerable. In the context of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, I believe that competition policy has a key role to promote a sustainable and inclusive economic uh, recovery. And with that in mind, uh, we have uh, very recently, uh, namely three days ago, we released our strategic plan for the period 2021 to 2026 and the more detailed action plan for this year and next year. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and the consecution, the completion of the uh, strategic uh, development goals is one of the main uh, drivers of uh, both plans. So uh, in terms of specifically inequality, uh, we have two areas of, of action uh, that we believe may contribute to, uh, to the direction of uh, inequality. First, we seek to uh, have a precise identification of the contribution that uh, each and every one of our policies has towards the completion of uh, the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. This is part of uh, what we intend to do as part of promoting the competition culture. And secondly, we have uh, a focus, a major focus of, uh, uh, on some uh, activities, uh, uh, of our activities, I'm sorry, on those sectors and practices that are more relevant in terms of these uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, let me just mention a few and, and I'll well, finish. Let's, let's, let's keep that for the next round. Okay, I'm sure okay. I'm going to ask you about that. And let's keep this round a bit short. It's interesting that the Spanish competition Authority explicitly links its, its action plan to the sustainable development goals, not saying we are doing everything we can to obtain those goals, but we are going to make, make clear how what we do contributes to obtaining those goals. Let me now first turn to Martijn. Martijn, yesterday morning in one of the panels, two of your colleagues presented a paper in this conference. They were very careful to say it's not a paper of ACM, but it's a paper of their personal uh, on a personal uh, authorities, personal account. Um, still, it's interesting that people from the ACM are explicitly thinking about inequality uh, within competition law uh, in the Dutch setting. So can you reflect also a bit on what has been said and say a bit more about what's happening at ACM? Yeah, so um, I mean, for, for those of you who, who are not familiar with our institution, is we are a multifunctional uh, authority. So we are not only a competition authority, but also consumer protection authority, telecoms authority, and energy regulator. And um, uh, I think the, our overall mission is making markets work well for people and businesses now and in the future. So we see ourselves as an authority that tries to protect people and businesses uh, against market failures in general of various types. One of these market failures obviously is market power. Uh, another market failure is information asymmetry. Uh, and a third market failure in which we have a role is uh, asymmetric contractual relationships. So market power, information asymmetry, and asymmetrical uh, contractual relationships across the wide scope of our, uh, of our mandate. And um, as such, we believe that equity or equality are, are, are part of our DNA and are almost, you know, ne flow natural into the things we do because protection against market power is, is in a way protection against inequality. And the same goes for information asymmetry and, and the same goes for uh, asymmetric contractual relationships. What we can do in practice is of course, you know, set in the laws of the in the various sectors, and there are limitations on what we can do because governments sometimes have decided to give uh, the protection against certain types of information asymmetry or asymmetric contractual relationships to a different regulator, or put it into the hands of the courts and, and makes it part of a civil law contractual regulation rather than public authority oversight. Um, but 
focusing on competition law only, uh, we also see uh, the focus is on protection of people and businesses against market power. And, and, and there we, we see a clear role for uh, equity and equality considerations when it comes to uh, prioritization of cases, uh, very similar, I think, to what uh, Jochen just said. Uh, advocacy, uh, uh, you know, when we, if we want to change things, if we, need, we think there is market power that we cannot by ourselves uh, uh, combat, that we ask the regulator, the, the legislator to step in, and by general communication of, because I think it requires, and now I'm focusing on competition authorities only, it requires a bit more explanation by competition authorities, why competition protects against inequality and promotes equity. And I think as competition authorities around the world, we can do probably a better job in that. Thank you very much. This is already, I'm, I'm summing up what we've heard so far. And if you have questions, drop them in the chat. So Teresa started by saying, especially in developing countries, there's perhaps more leeway to really integrate inequality and equity concerns in competition law. But both Johannes, Joaquin and Martijn have explained already that he also within the European setting, there is things that they can do. And at least that there is a connection between what the competition authorities um, might do and generally sustainable development goals of which one is of course combating inequality. So let's 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 try to sort of follow up a little bit and focus on 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 then the instruments. Uh, Martijn just mentioned advocacy, prior, prioritization, choosing the cases you want to focus on, and communication. Let's turn back to Joaquin. Um, so you you started telling us a bit about the two focus areas that the Spanish Competition Authority is focusing on. Which ones are those? And then are, are you do you agree with Martijn that those three instruments are at your disposal? Yes, we are in, in terms of uh, our setup, we are a very similar authority to the ACM. Uh, the only uh, bit that we do not have is, is the protection of consumer, is consumer protection as such. We indirectly protect consumers by enforcing competition and advocating competition policy, but not, uh, but we don't have uh, direct enforcement powers uh, with regard to consumers. So. Uh, I, uh, as I said, uh, we uh, want to focus our activities uh, towards the, the completion of the uh, sustainable development goals, one of which, as you said, is, is inequality, the reduction of inequality. Uh, and now we have uh, some of the uh, good tools, uh, the good instruments to do that. And we rely mainly on the same uh, areas that Martin just mentioned, namely advocacy, uh, communication also as part of advocacy and enforcement. So uh, in the part of, uh, in the area of advocacy, we have ample, uh, uh, ample uh, uh, capacities. Uh, we, we are one of the authorities with, uh, I would say, uh, and I'm proud of that because I'm the director You're of the head of the department. Right? Yes. Uh, I, I'm proud to say that we are one of the authorities uh, which is more active uh, in the uh, study of uh, markets or in the release of recommendations to the public sector in order to make others do what we cannot do uh, in, in as Martin uh, explained. Now we have uh, included in, in the recently released action plan a number of studies that focus precisely on uh, markets where consumers are uh, very vulnerable. And so, so they have uh, a significant contribution to uh, reducing inequality. Some of these, just to mention, uh, we are studying, we are about to conclude a study on intercity uh, bus transport. Uh, we are also about to uh, finalize a study on the distribution of medicine. Uh, and we are looking to, uh, we, we would like to start new studies on insurance markets, housing markets, and uh, specifically a, a discussion paper on competition and inequality, on, on precisely the, the topic of this conference, which is very useful for me. Secondly, uh, um, uh, as you said, uh, we, uh, until very recently, we were one of the few European authorities th uh, that could not prioritize uh, our enforcement cases. We needed to respond to all complaints that we received with regard to potential infringements of the competition law provisions. Now, uh, last month, uh, 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 as part of the process of the transposition of the ECN Plus directive, a new law 
was passed that gives us precisely this ability to prioritize. Yeah? So we, uh, it not only gives us the ability to prioritize, but also the criteria which we should follow in prioritizing. And uh, the criteria, well, is, is, it makes a lot of logical uh, sense. We, uh, we may decide not to focus on those complaints where there is low likelihood of showing, uh, of demonstrating the potential illicit, where there is a low, uh, potentially low consumer harm, or where we have other tools, uh, like, for example, advocacy tools, which could be more effective to address the uh, to address that uh, issue. Uh, and then we also uh, can uh, and, and need to follow the priorities set by the board. So as part of these priorities, as I mentioned in the beginning, are the, the completion of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. I think that will make us much more effective in this regard. Aren't you happy that you have now the option of prioritizing cases? I can imagine that changes how you how you deal with cases. Um, Johannes, when we had the, the preparatory call, and it's not a secret that these types of panels always have a preparatory call. So you, you told us a little bit about the position of the consumer associations. And that led Kati and Jan and me, when we discussed it afterwards, to, to, to think about, are there ways within, within the priority setting and the advocacy and the communication instruments that you have, are there ways to further institutionalize, let's say, the voice of, of underrepresented groups or the groups that suffer most from inequality? And can you perhaps also share with the audience how you deal with the consumer association? Um. So, um, we actually, uh, your, your, your sound is very, is not very clear. Can you, can you hear yes, me now? Much better. Yes, yes, excellent. So we have signed um, MOUs um, with the principal uh, consumer associations in Greece. I mean, that was done uh, almost like a month after um, we took over uh, at the authority um, in August 2019. Um, and um, we uh, also change our uh, priori priority uh, kind of guidance uh, for, for our cases, prioritization guidance. Uh, so as to include uh, in the complex uh, equation that we use uh, providing uh, various indicators, you know, for different things, um, we provided uh, additional weight to um, uh, complaints that are coming out of the consumer associations that we have been cooperating with. So um, from that perspective, um, we thought that uh, we will uh, somehow empower these consumer associations to bring cases to the competition authority. Um, now that hasn't really um, led to uh, many cases being brought by these consumer associations, but this has to do probably with the lack of resources that they uh, suffer in Greece. Um, I mean, we are a country that has been in economic crisis of almost a decade, and that affected also the funding of these consumer associations. We're now thinking of ways to uh, help them in their funding. Uh, for instance, uh, when we, uh, so what we have been thinking lately is if they bring us a, a complaint, uh, a possible remedy that we could uh, somehow impose uh, could probably take the form of a Cypress sort of, sort of remedy that will uh, somehow fund uh, some sort of uh, training program that could be organized by these specific consumer associations. We have also um, uh, completed a uh, training program with the BEUC. We cooperate quite closely with BEUC to uh, train consumer associations, not only from Greece, but also uh, from other uh, European countries. And uh, this will uh, take place, I mean, the first uh, training program in June. Um, so uh, as well as uh, with regards to other um, uh, interests, uh, I mean, we have been uh, working very closely with SMEs. Um, I mean, um, uh, more than in Greece, we have 800,000 SMEs. I mean, most Greek companies are actually SMEs, uh, have less than nine uh, employees. So um, we have been uh, cooperating with them uh, in different forms. Uh, first, obviously, to find out more information about what they're doing. Secondly, uh, enabling them to um, use a whistleblowing type of possibilities that uh, we have. Um, and thirdly, uh, we elaborated and we will um, launch uh, next month a sandbox for sustainable development, yeah. uh, which could also profit um, the, uh, the SMEs, uh, not, but not only SMEs. 
Uh, and more generally, we have been thinking a lot about collective bargaining as a, a way to deal with uh, problems. Um, I'm thinking in particular uh, in uh, monopsonies in labor markets. Um, and in particular for, for freelancers and the small micro enterprises, uh, which uh, are forming basically the backbone of the Greek um, economy. Um, and in terms of um, uh, generally, you know, thinking about um, uh, SMEs, um, we are also integrating um, the possibility for them to cooperate more. So uh, we are somehow opening up spaces of, uh, of cooperation, of authorized cooperation, let's put it that way, um, by including in our new law uh, a, a possibility of adopting non-enforcement action letters uh, that could possibly help them in some uh, situations. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, you know, uh, in our um, market shaping initiatives, because um, we have, we're only competition authority, but we have uh, this new competition tool that the commission so much wanted to use. I mean, something like the market investigation references in the UK. So in our uh, current uh, market shaping type of initiatives in the uh, construction sector, for instance, uh, as well as in, in the press distribution sector, um, we are really taking into account very uh, closely uh, the interests of uh, small and medium enterprises and the different sorts uh, in each of the sectors too. Uh, compete um, and so somehow uh, be able to um, uh, to uh, sustainably develop. Um, but I can discuss a bit more about the market shaping initiatives. Um, uh, let's they... let's see. Let's move on with the discussion. See if we can return because I, I on the background is also a question in my head: the protection of SMEs or helping them. How does that directly relate to inequality? But let's. I also saw that Martin Peter has a has an interesting question in the chat. But uh, I'm going to finish this round first by turning to Teresa and then to Martijn, and then I'm going probably to give Martin Peter the floor to ask his question. So if the panel members want to read it already, that's fine. Um, Teresa, but I'm going to ask Martin Peter also to ask the question live. Um, Teresa, your experience, so, so we've listened to, to Joaquin and Johannes and also Martijn uh, in the previous uh, round, uh, listing the instruments and it's all, they're doing quite a bit uh, or they're trying to do quite a bit on, on uh, shaping or helping uh, to combat inequality where that's possible within the framework that they're given. Now, if, if, if we look at, let's say, the developing countries, is the picture pretty much the same? Is it also using prioritizing cases, advocacy, doing market studies, communications, or is there something more that could be done? So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, thank you. Well, first of all, let me start by uh, underlining that, of course, the UN Agenda 2030 and the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals bound all the countries and organizations. And it was very interesting to hear from Joaquin, the, uh, the Spanish example. The, the thing is that um, market concentration and uh, abusive behavior by some global digital players, just to give an example, of course, have increased and will continue to increase inequality within and between countries, unless some measures are taken. And the thing is that from um, ANCTAD's point of view, um, let me try to clarify a little bit uh, what I said earlier. So according to the UN set uh, on competition, this development dimension is recognized translating into something like public interest clauses in the competition legislation of developing countries. But however, these public interest clauses, because they have a sort of exceptional nature, they should be limited in time. And of course, not used as a continuous kind of thing. So I, I'm, well, we all know that the EU model and probably the US model, as far as competition uh, uh, law templates between brackets are concerned, have been those most influential. So I, I think what, what I can say is that in general, despite these exceptional clauses that some developing countries have introduced in their legislation to have concrete leeway to, um, to consider specific needs of their markets, of their societies, I would suggest that uh, uh, competition line policy in general uh, is not necessarily limited to uh, pursuing economic efficiency. 
and it allows for some leeway. And I think throughout the pandemic, so since March last year, we saw examples across the world where using the existing provisions, very specific cases that contributed to reduce inequality in the ultimately um, took place. Of course, I will go to South Africa because it is always the, the example for this public interest clause and in a very successful manner, even though South Africa has had competition law and policy for over 20 years. So they, they have used this to include the empowerment of historical, uh, historically disadvantaged persons. And so they really use this clause to pursue uh, inclusive development. Uh, also, there have been cases all over the world, in Brazil, in Peru, in Kenya, again in South Africa, in Indonesia, where considerations of um, key consumer goods and services and needs of vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers and micro and small and medium sized companies were really at the heart of a lot of measures. I, I, I'm not, how can I put it? I don't think I can really say that this shows that these um, decisions, these actions, these guidance, these uh, documents were, were, were uh, due to reduce inequality as such, but they clearly uh, illustrated how competition law and policy um, can be used as an instrument to contribute to the reduction of inequality. And so, and I think in a way that is the point. Of course, here I would have to take a very personal point of view. <laughs> That's not necessarily Angtad's point of view. Maybe because I come from Europe and have had the experience in the European uh, um, competition framework setting, I personally favor using the existing legislation, which is broad enough and actually remain um, appropriate throughout decades to pursue priorities such as the, the, the ones mentioned by our Spanish colleagues or, or by, by Johannes in, in Greece without necessarily amending legislation. Uh, but again, this may be a little bit influenced by, by uh, EU experience and not necessarily applicable to the rest of the world, especially because I realize that in developing countries, even for foreign uh, investors, it is extremely important to ensure legal certainty and predictability. And sometimes the leeway um, underneath competition law provisions may, may, be, um, may interfere with, their, with that need for legal certainty and predictability. So um, I, I think we saw all th these examples throughout the pandemic, which are still taking place. I do think that competition law and policy in developing countries, probably even more than uh, everywhere else, should have a positive impact uh, against inequality. But from my point of view, this cannot be the, of course, the, the unique instrument, the unique policy to, to achieve this goal. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, Martijn, um... I was going to ask the question, what prevents you from doing the same um, as some of these other countries? But I think the answer is very clear in the, in the European context or in the Dutch context, we don't have a clause like in the South African context. Um, but perhaps you can also reflect on what has been said both by Johannes, Joaquin and Teresa uh, on, on the position of competition authorities in this field. So what, 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 what hinders broadening up the scope? What limits you? Well, I think not much. Ah, uh, so uh, uh, I think I agree with Theresa is that the, that the current laws, you know, give a wide variety of options. And let me, let me give a couple of examples of things that we are now working on at the moment or have finished just recently. You know, we, we recently finished the emerger investigation where we looked into monopsony effects on labor markets uh, and came to the conclusion that there was no such effect. So we approved the merger, but nevertheless, it was part of our investigation. We have now a pending investigation against a wage cartel uh, between you know, big companies uh, with lots of uh, uh, low-skilled, low-paid uh, employees. 
we're looking at them. This is not uh, no project. You know, anything can happen in the investigation, but it's part of our investigation, and it shows that competition authorities can indeed prioritize their cases, and specifically look at uh, cases that have an impact on uh, on on low income employees. We uh, we are very much focused also on uh, purchasing power. So we have uh, now a second phase merger investigation where we are looking what the effects are of the merger on the purchasing from farmers. It's, it's a product, animal product, uh, from, from far, farmers. And we look what the effects are of the merger. Will it lead to a decrease in prices? Uh, and and uh, and here is the interesting question: is of course what will happen with uh, efficiencies? Will they be passed on or not? And to whom will they be passed on? In this case, it may well be that the efficiencies in the form of lower prices will be passed on, but not to Dutch consumers. Uh -huh. So Dutch small and medium-sized enterprises pay you know, the price in the sense they will get less for their products, but ultimately. Uh, uh, non-Dutch citizens will get a lower price. You know, a dilemma for a Dutch competition authority. We're looking at the moment we have two uh, cartel cases pending in uh, also uh, creating purchasing power uh, uh, and in secret cartels uh, where you know, we take the position that if you create a car purchasing cartel that is an object infringement per se illegal, we don't have to look at the effects uh, on, uh, on consumer prices uh, uh, simply. And here it is again, purchasing power by bigger companies against small and medium sized enterprises, particularly small enterprises. Uh, we picked up again uh, retail price maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, also from the philosophy that um, you know in markets where the companies that engage in uh, retail price maintenance have some degree of market power due to their due to their brand brand strength, uh, and what they do with uh, with their RPM is they take away the opportunities for price sensitive consumers, particularly low income consumers. So that's why we reprioritized RPM in these specific cases. And final example, that's we are taking baby steps into that direction is that we have the new platform to business regulation coming into force or that has already come into force, but we'll get the authority to enforce the platform to business regulation. And we have the unfair competition rules in the agricultural sector that are about to enter into force where we will also get enforcement priorities to look and to enforce the rules in asymmetrical contractual relationships uh, in order to kind of rebalance uh, the, the, the position of small and medium-sized enterprises. So th this shows that for competition authorities already within the, the current structure of the law, there is plenty of opportunity to achieve equity and, uh, and equality uh, objectives. Good answer. Now we're going to open up, uh, we're going to go into the, the questions, which means for, um, for my panel members that we might diverge from, from what we have prepared. Uh, that also means that if you want to answer specific questions, just butt in, raise your hand. Let's see. I do want to start with Martin Peter because I promised. And Martin Peter, I read that you have a bad hair day, but still, could you turn on your camera and ask the question? Hi. Switch on your mic too. Hi, hello, Anna. Yeah, so that was just for you, of course, about the bad hair day, but... Really? I did not say... Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Um, but I'm running between things because there's other things going on today as well, so I also couldn't attend the morning session. Um, but um, I, I have a, a burning question, uh, so I couldn't help myself put it in the chat um, to the panel members. Uh, it's, 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 you know, these priorities, that's one thing, right? Um, that is interesting. And there's also some problems there. So I'm a bit worried that if, um, you know, there's so many cases, competition authorities have limited amount of means. If parties start knowing that um, the competition authority will particularly look at cases where there's something at stake for the poor, then uh, they might, you know, feel safe uh, ripping off the rich. Huh? And so cartels in sectors where uh, 
the rich are particularly active, like um, expensive cars or what have you, um, you know, they might know that the probability of being detected small because the competition authority is so busy with these other cases so that that's one thing we discussed that already a little bit yesterday i'll be happy to of course if the panel can comment on that oh you unmuted yourself by accident oh sorry yeah. on that potential risk as well the real i think the really interesting uh oh i'm getting some i'm getting some compliments on my hair even on the chat now uh, i should have started that so the the, re the real interesting question i think is where we are talking about trade-offs okay so the Dutch Competition Authority has not been shy in the sustainability domain, as you know, to say, well, consumers might be harmed if there's compensation uh, in welfare from non-consumers that benefit from the sustainability benefits from a horizontal anti-competitive agreement. So my question to the panelists, could you envision also cases where uh, the poor are uh, benefiting from a horizontal agreement or a merger the rich are suffering, they pay higher prices, but you know, you're willing to make that trade off, give a higher weight in the consumer surplus, basically unpack the average consumer that is to be compensated and say, the weight on the poor, we make it larger than on the rich. And so if the poor are benefiting from the horizontal agreement or the merger, but the rich are being ripped off more, even though total welfare goes down without weights, uh, that would be st still something that we would accept because uh, of our high weight on the poor, a high weight on the on the inequality issue. It's a good question. Your Honours, you're burning to answer. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going through these elements of an answer, let's put it that way. But I, I think, you know, the whole uh, debate comes back again to what we really uh, consider about uh, equality. I mean, I would take in the prioritarian view, I would take in the egalitarian view, I would take in actually a complex equality view. Let me just say that if uh, what we have in mind is a con uh, the concern, let's say, over inequality, uh, is uh, the uh, the equal part of resources? Okay, that would that would be the egalitarian view. Uh, so in this case, in your scenario, uh, Martin Peter, the fact that um, the difference, let's say, between uh, the uh, uh, income, uh, what actually the you know the benefit basically that the uh, the poorer get compared to the losses that uh, actually the uh, the richer consumers get. I mean, uh, someone that will take that view of, a, of, of an inequality, I mean, they will accept this merger. If uh, we take the prioritarian view, the prioritarian view is uh, what we're interested in is improvements in available income for the worse off. Possibly in this case, um, you know, if we define the worse off as a, the specific category uh, of uh, poor consumers and we'll say, we'll say okay, we'll, that particular horizontal merger uh, or whatever uh, cartel uh, provide a, a, an improvement on the available income of these worse off. I mean, which is also a very difficult claim to build. Huh? Uh, I mean, you know, how is it possible that uh, restriction of, um, of competition uh, will actually lead to uh, uh, improve uh, the available income for the worse off? I mean, it's, it, 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 it is a question. I mean, you know, I, I cannot really envision it practically, but, you know, in this context, uh, yes. I mean, if it leads to an improvement level of income for the worse off, even if it leads to uh, also increase the income of uh, of the richer, I mean, uh, parts of the um, of the consumers, I mean, then you know we'll accept that too. And the third view actually will uh, find this, uh, you know, the complex equality view will find um, maybe this um, uh, this uh, practical case uh, as irrelevant because uh, what actually we're interested in. Um, is um, the uh, quest, let's say, for equal status, for equal consideration um, in terms um, of uh, positioning, uh, of structural positioning uh, of these different, so, uh, these different groups. So if this merger uh, will um, not improve, uh, may, maybe could improve, uh, let's say, for, uh, uh, for a very short period of time, uh, the, uh, the income perspective of, of the poor, but it could provide, let's say, to the new entity, some power over uh, this particular group uh, and they could exploit it in the future uh, because the structural positions of the market uh, would be uh, would be worse uh, then in this case you know will not accept this type of merger uh, so i think depending on the uh, on the way you think about inequality um, if you take the egalitarian view the prioritarian view or the complex equality view uh, then you know you might uh, arrive to different conclusions but, but basically the answer fine. basically the answer is yes if you take the first and the second, yes. If you if take I come up with a good example, you would say yes. 
Can, if we take the first and the second, but I didn't know, I, I, I explicitly nah, okay. that sure, I'm sure. taking the third perspective at the beginning, and this is what I put in my paper as well. All right. Yeah, and, and Johannes answered the question, I think, more as an academic than as the, the president of the Hellenic competition. Of course, I speak, uh, all, everything I say today is on my personal capacity. Yeah, of course it is. So it's not clear what the Hellenic competition authority might actually choose, which perspective it might choose in a, in a specific case and whether it can choose that ex ante already. Um, Martijn, Joaquin, Teresa, do you want to comment on this? Martijn is unmuted, so yes. Yeah, I'll be happy to comment, but I'm not going to answer with a yes or a no. Uh, uh, but maybe a couple of uh, angles that, that I think should be taken into account. First is, you know, first, Mark Peter's first question with respect yeah. will this lead to under enforcement for the rich, which I think is, yeah, it could be, and it is, and it is an unintended consequence if it could be. And, and so therefore, if we have indications that that is exactly what is happening uh, with more cartels for the rich people, then obviously we should recalibrate our, our approach. But there is a but. Uh, I think uh, we have private enforcement also available, you know, most likely more available for the rich than for the poor. Uh, they have better access to justice, better access to highly paid lawyers, and possibly also the gains or the losses in um, uh, cartels for high net worth individuals are bigger, which allows for kind of also alternative fee arrangements that will uh, allow private enforcement. But yeah, you know, ultimately the goal of, of, of our competition authority and the prioritization should not be a redistribution uh, between the wealthy and the poor. And if that is actually happening, then, then I think we're, that's, that's not what we should do. Uh, on, the, on the second question, you know, there could be hypothetical problems. So that's why I'm hesitant. I don't know, just I don't want to, I, I, I'd like to answer kind of more in specific cases. But what I can say is what we did, for example, in the area of self-employed workers. So uh, what we did is we uh, interpreted the competition laws in a way and prioritized our cases in the sense that we allowed self-employed workers to unionize and to uh, cooperate at the fee level uh, equal to the minimum wage. Uh, so we said, you know, it cannot be true that competition law forces uh, self-employed workers to work below the minimum wage. And, and we, we took a minimum wage equivalent taking into account different social security uh, system for self-employed workers. And that in a way is a sort of redistribution because it's a redistribution between the more well-to-do employers, could be individuals, could be, could be companies on the one hand, and on the other hand, the self-employed. So in that case, I think we took, a, we took a deliberate step in a sort of redistribution, if you, if you, can, if you can say it that way. Interesting. Cathy, can you help me out um, with the uh, questions? Which one should we yes, turn to? Um, certainly not mine. So uh, we, had, um, we had a question from Golda Meyer. I, I don't know if this is your name concerning Malawi. Ah, um, about financial markets, right? Yes. Um, um, so maybe we can take that. And there is a very, sorry, and then I will jump. There is a very interesting question also from from uh, the other Jan, <laughs> Jan Blocks. Um, so maybe you can take those two or bundle yes. them and then the panelists can, if they still have time. Yeah, okay. let's do- uh... Can I answer? Sorry. Yeah, Johannes? Yeah, I mean about the banks, actually. I think it's a quite interesting question. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Let, let, let's first have the question asked. Golda Meyer, oh, would you like to I, ask I, your I, question? I can read it now. Yeah. You, you jumped too quickly, Johannes. Golda Meyer, can you unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Not hearing anything? Then I'll read the question. So she asks, in relation to consumer protection, that's the one you, uh, you were pointing at, Kati. In relation to consumer protection, mostly regarding low-income learners, have you ever received complaints against banks, more particular on transaction fees for bank transfer transfers? In Malawi, consumers complain that banks are engaging in unconscionable conduct by charging them fees on internet banking when they're also deducted a fee at the end of the month. 
Have you received such complaints? How would you deal with that? Joanna, as you're dying to answer. Well, but yes, I also I, want actually, to give Joaquin the chance to answer because I know the, the Spanish Competition Authority did something with financial services. Joanna's first. Yeah, yeah so um, this is a pending case, so I cannot say a lot, but uh, yes, we will look to and we have been, we are looking now to um, uh, banking uh, charges um, for the use of ATMs or, um, or payment um, basic cards. Um, that led to the uh, biggest ever down rate of the uh, LN Competition Commission uh, in November 2019 to all the uh, systemic banks, as well as the Association of, of Banks. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, the importance of this investigation has uh, become even more prominent with uh, the COVID-19 situation uh, and the fact that now people are really using uh, a lot uh, e-commerce uh, for uh, even their groceries. So uh, to a certain extent, uh, what uh, we have been uh, looking at is um, obviously a possible uh, cartel, I mean, between uh, between the, the virus banks, uh, as well as uh, exclusionary behavior to um, a, um, a an innovator, let's say, uh, uh, a fintech company uh, that uh, uh, could possibly uh, provide an alternative uh, to um, the use of ATMs uh, for uh, specific consumers in order to uh, to raise uh, money actually in let's say in different shops etc so um, and this is obviously an uh, investigation has the highest priority um, in um, in the agency um, and I would say you know the same type of um, of issues that can arise out of um, you know, either collusion or uh, possible uh, market shaping situations, um, uh, you know, is uh, is quite common. And I think um, one of the other uh, issues that we have uh, we have raised, although we don't have a formally um, jurisdiction, um, uh, concerns mobile uh, data. Um, we're actually in Greece. We are among the um, uh, at least uh, as far as I can uh, see from uh, various um, studies, uh, one of the uh, countries in Europe with the highest. Um, uh, prices um, in terms of um, of the of data, um, and obviously this affects uh, young consumers and uh, poor consumers more. I mean, internet is obviously right now uh, and uh, uh, sort of a, a social right to a certain extent, um, and uh, uh, and we have uh, raised this issue uh, through advocacy. We actually commission a report. Uh, although we don't have jurisdiction in the telecom sector, this is um, quite unique, I would say. We in Mexico, um, OECD countries, the jurisdiction for competition enforcement lies with the telecom regulator. Uh, but actually, we raise this issue uh, because we think it's uh, it's particularly important. And generally, you know, our activity has been focusing on areas like uh, telecoms, uh, banking, and energy because we think that these are uh, quite significant for, in particular, um, poorer consumers. It's interesting. Let me turn to Joaquin, because when we prepared, we discussed several, let's say, grouped um, uh, themes of inequality. And one of them was a focus on, let's say, vulnerable people, vulnerable consumers or consumers at the lower end of the income scale. And I think some of the examples that we have already discussed now fall in that category, but there was also a Spanish case on financial services, right? Yes, exactly. We, uh, I mean, the uh, the concerns that we had in that case. Uh, well, first of all, let me say uh, it, it's been a very uh, a, a merger uh, between the third and fourth uh, largest banks in in Spain that we uh, very recently approved, uh, subject to uh, commitments uh, that were proposed by by the parties. And although the concerns were not do not exactly coincide with the ones that were expressed in the in the question, I think they can serve as an inspiration of the type of uh, concerns that uh, that link very much competition concerns and inequality uh, concerns. So the situation in the in the merger uh, was uh, that the, uh, the 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 merger would create in uh, in some areas in some geographical areas a situation of a monopoly or a duopoly with uh, third parties, so a significant reduction uh, in, uh, in effective competition uh, compared to the pre-merger situation. And uh, we were specifically concerned uh, about what would happen in uh, rural areas, dispersed areas, where uh, the 
population is typically uh, uh, aging population with uh, lower resources uh, to substitute uh, traditional retail banking uh, for, uh, for digital new forms of uh, fintech uh, and on other forms of digital uh, uh, retail banking services. So um, uh, we, um, what we did in the, in the merger was a much more detailed analysis um, a geographical analysis than, than in previous uh, cases, uh, we conducted an investigation by zip codes uh, and, and we tried to construct uh, isochrons uh, in those zip codes where concentration levels were uh, very high. And, uh, and this was uh, a shift uh, from, from previous uh, cases. And, and then we uh, also uh, uh, adopted some of the commitments uh, addressing precisely this uh, situation. We were uh, concerned about the potential financial exclusion of that uh, population. So we, uh, that could happen if the merging uh, entity would decide to close uh, some of their branches uh, post-merger or to, uh, to raise their prices or, or provide uh, their services uh, under poorer conditions. So uh, we asked them not to close uh, branches where they reached a monopoly uh, power. So in order to maintain the accessibility uh, and to prevent situations of financial exclusion, and uh, we also asked them to, or accepted the commitment, proposed them by them of uh, not, uh, of providing the same level of services, the same uh, uh, conditions uh, under which they were providing their services uh, in the pre-merger uh, situation. It's interesting because it's almost like a universal service obligation by way of commitments. Well, um, uh, actually, uh, actually, it is not because uh, we cannot improve the situation uh, compared with with the situation previous to the to yeah, the merger. Yeah. But 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 yes, uh, in some regard, it is. We uh, we had in mind uh, the the concern uh, about uh, financial exclusion of, of aging population population without uh, as much access as as uh, the urban population to digital services, uh, which. Could substitute these these retail services. So uh, we looked very much into the, uh, the into the harm that uh, they would receive uh, after the marriage. Yes. In a way, this is also an answer to Marta Peter's question, though in a roundabout way. That yes, there there can be a trade off in a way, but by way of commitments. I'm going to turn indeed to Jan Bloch's question, and I think then Teresa should be the one first trying to answer it. Jan, do you want to ask your question? Um. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I, I didn't manage to, to attend all of the presentations uh, uh, so far, so maybe uh, some of this has been uh, discussed uh, before, but uh, during some of the presentations uh, yesterday, uh, there was um, at, a, at a theoretical level uh, quite some discussion on equality and inequality and how this is increasing and so on. And then we always talk all of these uh, in all these debates, uh, there is a mention of income equality and income inequality and the share of, of uh, income of businesses that goes to labor and to, uh, uh, to or that is concentrated in the hands of uh, a few large uh, undertakings. But um, yeah, in, in competition law, uh, we have been working with this consumer welfare uh, paradigm. So uh, that implies that we focus on, on re reducing the spending of uh, citizens of ensuring that uh, their prices that they that they pay for goods and services are not too low and not on how much they earn mm -hmm. and so my question is isn't that uh, i mean there is now uh, a, a, um, a change because there is of course some uh, interest now in um, for example um, uh, competition in in labor markets uh, but in many areas uh, it seems that uh, we have rather have regulatory approaches, for example, when it comes to uh, in the food uh, sector, in, in, uh, in, in dealing with buyer power or monopsony uh, power, these are things that are often not dealt with under competition law. So yeah, my question is, isn't some of the, 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 the isn't there also not a philosophical, uh, theoretical um, problem underpinning uh, competition law insofar as it focuses unidirectionally on low prices for consumers rather than uh, high income uh, for uh, for producers and workers and, and so on. 
It's a it's a very interesting and very broad question in a way. Teresa, if 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 you would like to reflect on that, but perhaps also take into account the, the influence of the pandemic, especially in some of the countries that do not have the same budgetary buffer that some of the richer countries have. Absolutely. No, thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. What I can say, I think, from the point of view of developing countries, is only a question of prices. It's a question of access to goods and services, because in, uh, uh, in countries, for instance, where there is poor uh, ICT uh, infrastructure connection, you cannot even accede to, I don't know, e-commerce. So it's, it's not just the, the, the level of prices, is that you as a citizen, as a consumer are entitled to, to, to have wide choice and good quality prices, or you are entitled also, or you expect to have fair transactions when getting, uh, when, when, when buying goods and services. So I don't think it is just a question of price. Now, I, I understand the point. I cannot really say, I think there is, and frankly, and thanks Anna for mentioning the pandemic. I think a lot of the earlier cases, and it's true that competition authorities across the world were at the forefront of the reactions against abusive market, uh, abusive, abusive business practices. Let's put it like this, because of course this also covers consumer protection, uh, law infringements um, that, that somehow have also been uh, referred to in this discussion. But in those cases, when you talk about for instance, as, uh, access to masks and, uh, and um, personal protection equipment, et cetera, or key consumer goods, you know, uh, foods uh, and, and things you would need. It was first a question of access because in a lot of cases, there were not even enough products. Of course, in most of these cases that I mentioned, it could be uh, the price of the product or of the service, but it can just be even the, the, the 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 conditions of that transaction so that some dominant market players were abusing in order to well make the most out of their market power thereby preventing several uh, users and consumers to actually have access so i i think that the the experience that we have been uh, going through with the pandemic Although it provides very interesting examples, as I said earlier, of competition law enforcement actually contributing to, to concretely reduce inequality, I am not sure that this sets a sort of a trend, you see? This would be, again, my personal view. And I do believe that it is a very important topic to be discussed and further discussed, but I would go back to my, my earlier comments. I do believe that usually, competition law and policy is drafted, is designed in such a way that allows for the consideration of other goals than strictly economic efficiency, let me put it this way. And Cathy, uh, and Cathy, and Anna, if I may, because there, were, there was a very interesting question also from Cathy, but on sustainability, if I could take this opportunity. This well, is also a very, very important issue, but maybe you want to go back to this later. So. No, 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 I, it, it's fine, but then I want to first hear the question. Cathy, um, uh, uh, Teresa asks for your question, so why don't you ask the question? Well, yeah, I would have liked to uh, give the floor to, uh, to someone else, but... Um, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, my question was, I, I didn't formulate it very clearly, but I had the feeling that um, uh, many of the members of the of the panel were talking about um, consumers in a new co conceptual way that I have never heard uh, before. So the Spanish uh, Competition Authority um, several times also in the pre-call that we had uh, about vulnerable consumers, which puts you outside of what I knew so far as the competition law framework, who is uh, the consumer and competition enforcers seem to go to a certain extent like these are rational utility maximizer market actors, and we do not look at they are boundedly rational or weak or, or even uh, dummies. And um, Yanis, you were talking about SMEs, which I also agree with. So there is again a different conceptual uh, way. So I was wondering whether there is some interest or some new uh, understanding of yeah, who are your uh, customers at the end? <laughs> 
uh, and maybe linking it to Jan's question, indeed, maybe it's not the, we have to frame it also differently, not the consumer, but the worker or the, or the citizen, um, the taxpayer. So do you, do you see this as well, or it's just my, <laughs> I want to read my research into your work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with Johannes, because I know he has to leave in five minutes. Johannes, do you want to reflect on this question? And Martijn was also uh, waving his hand previously, so he wants to say something too. Johannes. Yeah, so uh, I mean, what I will answer, um, it takes into account my theoretical perspective, which is uh, that of complex equality. I'm neither a proletarian nor an egalitarian. Um, and also my other work on polycentric uh, competition law. So from my perspective, um, you know, what is important here is to understand what is the group, let's say, that you want to protect for uh, uh, reasons uh, that concern, let's say, complex equality, the structural positioning of that group in a situation of uh, permanent or quite pervasive inequality. And then at least this is really the criteria. So that group might be consumers, that group might be farmers, that group might be freelancers, that group might be SMEs, that group might be also digital startups uh, that um, uh, could be exploited by the gatekeeping position uh, of, of digital platforms. So uh, what actually you put in that group uh, depends basically on um, the um, specific uh, enforcement and application of the criteria of uh, structural inequality um, and positioning, basically, that uh, I, um, I discussed before. Mm -hmm. So um, unfair, um, low, fairly low prices can be a competition law concern and has been uh, a competition uh, law concern. Um, and I think for good reason uh, um, in some circumstances. Um, so um, I think that um, once we uh, somehow escape these uh, a narrow uh, perspective uh, of uh, consumer welfare that uh, I believe very few uh, nowadays um, accept. Um, uh, and we are somehow take uh, this more structural perspective on, on competition law enforcement, then I think we will have no difficulties to uh, conceptualize as well as to find the adequate metrics of power that we need in order to enforce competition law. Uh, so from this perspective, I think if you want to do this correctly, you have also to um, identify new ways and new methodologies and new metrics to assess power uh, in this context. And uh, maybe uh, I would say the um, uh, price theory uh, is not uh, going to help us there. And we can actually have uh, different sources of wisdom uh, that we can <coughs> turn to. Uh, and uh, also in some recent work that I've done uh, jointly with uh, Bruno Carballa and something that we implemented uh, in the in the in the Greek uh, supermarkets uh, inquiry, I mean that came out a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, we actually, you know, uh, try to use uh, social network analysis uh, in order to um, uh, basically in sociology, in sociological perspectives of power, in order to um, really assess uh, the bargaining power position uh, of the specific uh, supermarkets. Uh, or, you know, suppliers, I mean, because we were some agnostic uh, who was actually exercising, we did not know who was exercising the power. And we did that through the use of, um, of data. And I think the new technologies and the development of, uh, of computational, computational and economics uh, helps us uh, to uh, be, uh, although we don't really, will not, we probably have patterns uh, and, and that could build nice stories and narratives that could be plausible. But I think that's that's basically where we can move to, um, and I don't think we should um, we should have this this uh, fetich of quantification uh, that we had um, uh, the last few years. Um, uh, I mean, and this is something that also in the U.S. If you follow the debate about vertical uh, mergers, I mean, the guidelines, uh, you know, you have a very prominent authors like uh, Steve Salop or Fiona Scott Morton that criticize basically this uh, fetich of quantification. Uh, I mean, um, you know, building a plausible uh, narratives on the basis of, of this data, it could be helpful. And I invite you also, in case you have time, on Monday, I mean, we have a conference at the Hellenic Competition Commission, I'm sorry to make an advertising conference, your conference, uh, which uh, concerns uh, computational competition on economics and, um, uh, and basically the, the, the use of the new tools. And we put in place uh, this new tool with the creation of the HSC platform where we basically monitor uh, thousands of uh, prices and, 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 and in, the, in the next few months also quantities for uh, for products in the supermarket sector, but also uh, elsewhere. And so and this is something that I think 
will offer us great possibilities. Uh, in the this future. was a long and complex answer Sorry. with very many, no, 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 but there were very many interesting points. I have points to leave at 3.15. <laughs> And I know that you have to leave in one minute, so I'm going to thank you now for your contribution, Johannes. Uh, on the question of, of who the consumer is, if I am, I'm, I'm just simplifying your question, Kati, very much, and also collapsing, collapsing it in Jan's question a bit. Martijn. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, no, I, I think there is indeed a different view on, on who the consumer is. Uh, and, and it started also, we went through this also with defining what our mission is. We, although we are named the authority for consumers and markets, we deliberately chose our mission as uh, making markets work well for people and businesses. This was a deliberate choice with a, with a, with a meaning behind it, also to look at people rather than traditional consumer. So, this, uh, so yes, I, I, I agree with Kathy that there is a change in thinking uh, at least at my authority. Second, uh, the, the entire study in that from the behavioral economist and the behavioral psychologist on, on bounded rationality and heuristics has been taken on board, both in our consumer protection group and in our competition group. There is a but, is that I think that the case law uh, is a little bit behind. Uh, but I think here we have an, an obligation as an authority to push the case the case law forward. I think this is how we see our role as, as competition and consumer protection enforcers is also to bring cases that allow uh, courts to change course. Uh, you know, if, we, if, if we keep everything as is, nothing is going to change. So th that is also the reason why we are not afraid to lose cases from time to time uh, and, and, and to will continue to bring cases to push forward the, the law in the direction that we think is appropriate for this time. And thirdly, the, you know, I think we depart, as, an, as an authority, we departed from the consumer welfare standard. Uh, we were uh, supported by what we believe the Court of, Ju the Court of Justice had said in the GSK decision, that harm to consumers is not a necessary requirement for an intervention on the basis of competition law. European competition law is also focused on protecting the process of competition and protecting the structure of the market. So, uh, and, and this is, you know, in many cases, there is not an issue because, you know, protecting consumer welfare and protecting the process of competition or the structure of market go hand in hand. But particularly in the area of uh, purchasing cartels, buyer cartels, and buyer, buyer power, this is where it becomes difficult. And it's probably also the reason why there was significant under enforcement in the past decade, particularly in these two areas. I think both the European Commission, other authorities in Europe, and we as well, picked up the pace again and, and are now focusing much more or put equal weight on uh, purchasing cartels and, and, and purchasing power as a result of M&A transactions than as we look at the selling markets. So this is why it's sort of the reason why we have pending purchasing cartels and, and are really looking into uh, buying power as a result of, uh, of, of M&A transactions because we don't see fundamentally you know, what the difference is, is between creating market power in a selling market and creating market power in a buying market. Uh, both, you know, you create, you basically extract value from a different segment in the value chain as a result of the merger, not as a result of innovation. Uh, and that's why we are equally critical uh, on both in bo in both instances. So that was also an answer to Jan's question. Now, Joaquin, do you want to reflect a bit on the discussion so far? And then, mindful of the time, Teresa, and then we're going to go towards a wrap up. Joaquin first. Thank you, Anna. So uh, what I would say is that um, uh, one of the main advantages that we have as competition uh, authorities is uh, the fact that we are very technical in nature. We are typically, and, and we've been advocating for institutional designs where competition authorities had uh, an independent setup from that of the government so that our decisions are narrowed down uh, in, in, in in the sense that they take 
fewer things into account than uh, a government agency integrated in the, in the government would, would do. And uh, that is, uh, I think that's a very positive uh, point, uh, not only because our decision is, is very technical, but also because uh, our decision can be very well anticipated by the, by the market. Our decisions as enforcers are subject to review by the courts, uh, so they uh, have to follow some standards uh, some some uh, 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 some rules which can be uh, challenged and uh, where we need to prove with facts and evidence uh, what we uh, think uh, is is an illegal conduct uh, or or would mm -hmm. we think is an efficiency for uh, for a particular uh, uh, conduct so uh, i think that um, uh, in in this debate uh, uh, what uh, I would uh, what would be the, the, the main takeaway is that if we want we, we have easier to uh, to uh, change the priorities that we have as competition authorities that to change the substantive tests that we uh, use to uh, to uh, understand the uh, the conducts of uh, market participants and if we want to do uh, some some changes which i think our uh, current rules uh, allow uh, to to take into account more uh, objectives which which are uh, broader in in uh, in nature i think a very important point is is we need to uh, create standards which are uh, anticipated by by the market and uh, which are the same uh, for uh, all market participants. Uh, a, a, a very good advantage we have uh, at the European Union is that uh, in principle a cartel case would be treated the same uh, in any EU member state eh? if it were treated under uh, the competition law, the national competition law provisions or the uh, European provisions. And a final point, I mean, this, this does not provide an, an answer to all the interesting questions, but a final point is um, a, a point where I am um, more comfortable uh, in addressing, uh, which is the fact that uh, advocacy uh, um, already faces this type of, of questions very often. Uh, we face very often restrictions to competition in laws, in regulations, that have uh, a reason of of, uh, uh, of public interest uh, in nature, like uh, not only uh, addressing inequality concerns, but but also addressing uh, cultural concerns or uh, or environmental reasons. And I think those are perf perfectly uh, acceptable. But still, we um, we pass those um, regulations by a test. We have a test, which is uh, that those decisions need. To to be necessary and proportionate to answer to the uh, reason of, of general uh, interest, which is, is, uh, which is a good point uh, as a starting point. Thank you. Teresa, I'm going to turn to you now, but also ask a slightly more general question since we are moving towards the end of this session. And I'm going to integrate Jan Braulich's question in there, who asks, um, that, well, it's a, it's a question actually to Martijn and Johannes, but I'm going to ask it to you. He said, I'm reading it, Jan, that their competition authorities, so the Greek and the Dutch competition authority, are known as leaders of thinking about the relationship between competition law and sustainability. Now, I don't want you to focus on sustainability per se, but the question is, will you now also take a leading role in shaping the discussion with regard to inequality? I think that's what Jan's question is. So, Teresa since you are not at one of these agencies, would you give your perspective on should, should national competition authorities now take a role, a, a leadership role in shaping the future of competition law so that what you, you, you told us that you feel that there is more room within competition law to take inequality concerns into account. The Hellenic and the Dutch competition authority have shaped that in the sustainability discourse in a, in, in a certain methodology providing for the legal certainty that Joaquin was also touching upon. Do you think that for the national competition authorities in the European Union, it's now time to take that same step, but then with regard to inequality and equity? A European approach to inequality yeah, and equity th within Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, again, again, just disclaiming that it's I not know. in my capacity that I can talk about this. I do think, and I do know, of course, by, by experience that the EU um, competition law and policy has inspired countries throughout the world. And 
as as we see, for instance, in all uh, external agreements concluded by the EU, where the EU values, the EU key principles are reflected as conditions for a, a, a mere uh, trade and economic cooperation agreement. I do believe, as an European citizen, if you allow me, that the EU can very well lead this debate because it, it fits very much, first of all, within the broader EU values and scope, and it's very much uh, admissible under the EU competition law framework, as I mentioned. I thought that, the, the, let me just say on the sustainability, which is something that we are now starting to look after, uh, because uh, following the very interesting uh, developments of the ACM, which we have been following, of course, not necessarily clear how this can be fully translated between brackets to the developing world. But since biodiversity, biotrade is so important in so many developing countries, there is room here to explore this. And again, I think it is very um, interesting and frankly, very timely that the EU uh, competition authorities take this role and clearly for the EU to take this role. And uh, of course, from the UN point of view, what we really um, fight for is to have more international cooperation and regional cooperation. Because for instance, in issues like market concentration, and as I said, abuse of market power of digital platforms or key industry players, such as uh, the pharmaceutical industry and uh, uh, agro businesses and chemicals, most of these companies tend to be, of course, multinational, but often based in either the US or the EU. And whatever is decided by a EU competi national competition authority or by the European Commission can influence the status of the, of the economy in several developing countries in key areas. And of course, that will, can also somehow contribute to reduce inequality. So I'm sorry because I'm mixing a little bit these things, but we do believe that through international cooperation, um, developing countries can be supported and assisted. And in the end, as we, we see nowadays with the globalization and digitalization of the economy, most of the rogue traders are exactly the same. They have global dimension. And it is important to, to provide opportunities for startups and new companies in developing countries as to allow consumers in developing countries to have access at, let's say, the lowest prices, but with good quality and it, with good transactions. This would be my general comment. Thanks. Thank you very much. We also have, of course, uh, Professor Eleanor Fox here, who I'm not going to give the floor because we did not prepare this, but there are a, which who presents who might present us with the USA perspective. But of course, Teresa is also arguing that we should cooperate in, in leading the world, perhaps, with the developing countries themselves, which is exactly what UNCTAD is doing as well. Uh, we have three minutes left. I'm going to ask Joaquin to give his final comments. Are you going to take up the 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 yeah, the, the the gauntlet that Teresa throws in your court? And will the Spanish Competition Authority now take the lead in including inequality concerns in its competition law assessments? Well, uh, first of all, let me say, Anna, that uh, as uh, other speakers, I'm speaking purely on a, on a personal capacity. So I won't be able to answer to your question since I'm not the head of the, of the Spanish authority nor the board. So, uh, but uh, what I say is, uh, what I believe is, is very important is that we raise this uh, debate. I think um, competition policy is one of the policies uh, that can do a lot uh, in order to reduce inequality, um, it uh, main, maybe it's not the main policy. Uh, when we, if one thinks of how to address uh, the reduction of, of inequality, maybe uh, one may not think of competition policy. But I believe that competition policy uh, should be placed in the agenda as one of the drivers for economic growth and for not only 
economic growth as such, but also for inclusive and sustainable economic growth. So what competition authorities can do uh, in the very short uh, term is to explain to the society better why we are important, uh, why competition policy is very important uh, in order for the, not only for inequality, but for, for the development, goal, sustainable development goals uh, in general, what we can do. And, and, uh, and I think that's part of the, uh, that, Part of of the of the starting point. Then, if we need to to change uh, something, I think the debate is is very uh, welcome. And and uh, uh, what I would, in a very personal capacity, advocate is is that it was as as much consensual as possible. Eh? And and I think there is a point where consensus can be uh, easily reached. Thank you. Thank you, Joaquin. Martin, Gauntland is also in your court. <laughs> Well, I think different from the sustainability discussion here is that there is more consensus on, on kind of the interpretation of the law and the sustainability issue. We have uh, we had a discussion about whether there should be a separate sustainability paragraph in in the uh, in the horizontal guidelines. I think we are now beyond that. There's general consensus, consensus is yeah, there should be probably a, a, a sustainability paragraph, but what will be in it? And there's, I think, the big controversial debate is now about what is a fair share of the benefits. Uh, and, and so there is more controversy here and also more, I think, need for action uh, by the national competition authorities to, to push for a change. Um, and I think here, when it comes to the substance of competition law, you know, with respect to buyer power, what we talked about, the wage cartels, I think there's by and large consensus in Europe about that these are things are illegal. Uh, and it's a question of prioritization. And there, I think it's, it, it really is important to leave room for national enforcers to set their own priorities. Uh, so, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant, you know, to throw in, to take on the gauntlet and, and go on the barricades to advocate a change in Europe. But I think it is important, and that, that's also something that this entire debate also within our agency, do all credits to Annemiek and Marcel, who wrote the paper submitted to the conference, uh, that we looked at our own old prioritization document and prioritization guidelines and thought, well, you know, in light of the current new thinking, that document needs an update. So uh, I'm pretty confident that officially in our prioritization scheme, inequality, and you know, uh, whatever name we're going to give it, will have a place. Thank you. So that brings us almost to the end. Um, I, I Just a personal note, I remember 10 years ago when I did my inaugural lecture on sustainability and competition law, quite a few people in the audience came to me afterwards and said, well, you're taking way too big steps here. Sustainability cannot be incorporated in competition law. It's impossible what you want. You, you sketch a view that is beyond everything we can imagine. I think, and then of course, in the 10 years time, and, and I was not the first one to point this out, there were other people also, of course, talking about sustainability. Um, and I think what happened in, in, in between, in the decade between, is that many more people took up the issue, more academics became involved in the debate, more competition authorities saw in concrete cases that they needed to address at least some of the issues in the sustainability discourse. So this might be the beginning of a beautiful journey to do the same thing with inequality and wealth issues within competition law. And who knows, in 10 years time, competition law has a different face again. I have to apologize to all the audience members whose questions we could not address. I saw in the chat that there's a lively discussion going on and lots of questions that are relevant and interesting, but that we could not cover today. I want to thank uh, Jan and Kati for convening the panel. And I want to especially thank Joaquin, Martijn, Teresa and Johannes for their contributions and thank the audience for listening and tuning in. So I'm going to say and close the session now and say goodbye to you all. Bye.